In Luke chapter 15, Jesus gives three parables in this chapter, and it all has to do with an attitude that we find at the beginning, being expressed at the beginning of this chapter. In Luke chapter 15, in verse 1, we see then, then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he spoke this parable to them, saying, All right, so he, he speaks the parable of the, the shepherd with 100 sheep, one goes astray. He then speaks of the parable of the lost coin, the woman who has 10 coins. She loses one, and she does everything she can to find the one, the lost coin. Then he begins that of what is typically referred to as the prodigal son or the lost son. And that's where really it goes into an understanding of this attitude or expressing this attitude in this parable. And it's the, you have a father, an older brother, and a younger brother, older son, younger son. And uh, with the, with the younger son, the younger son is the prodigal son. He's going to go away. He rejects his father entirely, rejects everything that he has. He just wants the benefits that he would receive from his father were his father to die, and that's it. You will see me no more, and he's gone. All right, so he plunges into sin. He leaves to a far country. You don't even know where he went. But the older brother stays, that older son, the older son stays, but he still has a problem. And that is the one that's being, going to be addressed as well in this. But let's look back at verse 2, and you have the Pharisees and the scribes, and they are complaining against Jesus. Well, they're looking for anything. Truly, they are a, an attitude, they're an attitude looking for an issue of, I know he's wrong, I just haven't seen it yet. Or I know he's not the Christ, I just can't prove it yet. Or I know that he's imperfect, I just, we need to do something to trip him up. That's an attitude looking for an issue. Or that's a problem with the heart. That's a problem, entire problem with the heart. They did not want him to be the Christ. They didn't want him to be the Christ. Well, it doesn't matter what they want. It's what, what's the truth of the matter. Now, they are, tr they are correct that you have tax collectors and sinners drew near to him, and they say that he receives sinners and eats with them. Well, the audacity of it, the audacity of it, of he's, you know, that's not anything they would do. They wouldn't want to be seen uh, with, with sinners, and they most certainly would not be eating with them. They wouldn't be receiving them. Well, here is the thing. If God will not receive sinners who want to listen to Him, if He won't do that, we all have a problem, including the scribes and the Pharisees. We all have a massive problem. Because while my sins are at a certain level, I still have sin. And I could point my finger at somebody else that their sins are at a greater level. Well, you know, if, if God won't attend to them, if He won't show mercy to them, He's not going to show mercy to me either. Because sin is the very thing that has separated us from God. That's the very thing. And as we see in that first parable, the shepherd is willing to go and look for the lost sheep. He's willing to do it. He's not, he, he's not satisfied with saying, oh, yeah, all right, um, I've got 99 others. Because this really has to do with not so much sheep. It has to do with human souls. It happens, it happens to be, you can just think of it like children. Someone has a, a, a large house. They are a large home. They've, they've got lots of children, and one go missing. One goes missing. What do they say? Okay, well, I've got nine others, you know, uh, you know, whatever. I've got nine others. That, that's good enough. No, they will go look for that lost child. In this, God goes. In that first parable, 
He goes looking for that lost sheep. In the second parable, uh, you have uh, the one who is looking for that lost coin. Now, let's discuss the lost son, because this one has some differences to it. This, this goes deeper than the other two went, uh, because it's, it's really different, dealing with a slightly different issue. Now, we go to verse 11. Then he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. All right. In essence, what the younger son said was, whatever you would get, whatever I would get, rather, whatever I would get at your death, I want it now. I'm not going to wait for you to die. I want it now. Okay. So... He does. The father does. He divides up the, the, the goods. He divides up the livelihood as it existed then. And what the younger son would have gotten, he receives it. Now, he's relatively wealthy. No doubt he is. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. So this younger son, who's this describing? This would describe those tax collectors and those sinners. That's who, that's who he's describing. And that's not to say that all tax collectors were the worst sort of people, but they most certainly were thought to be that way. But he's talking about those sinners, those that were coming to Christ. Well, what... What did you want them to do? Let's just go back to that and address it again. What did you want them to do? Did you want the sinners to reject the Christ? And the answer would be, yeah, like us. For the scribes and the Pharisees, yeah, like us. So that's what, so they have no hope whatsoever. So you get to decide what they do. You get to decide whether God sees them or not, whether God will attend to them or not, where God either teaches them or not. You get to decide that then they truly are doomed. And so are the scribes and the Pharisees who would be such a gatekeeper, a gatekeeper of the Christ, both saying, saying he's not the Christ and don't go and listen to him anyway. Okay, he's not the Christ and, and uh, just you, you don't need to, to hear any of his teaching whatsoever. Here the younger son he leaves, and he wastes his possessions. That's everything that he had been given from his father with prodigal living. So what's prodigal living? It's wasteful living is what it is. It's just I'm wealthy, and it's time, suddenly wealthy, and I'm independent. I'm going to do as I please. It's time to party. It's time to show some cash. It's time to, to do what I've always dreamt of doing. And when you do that, you know, you're going to attract people that, yeah, they'll, they will serve you all right. You're paying for it. They will serve it. Uh, you're, you're paying it out. They will serve it out. They don't have a problem with that. They don't have a problem. With, and, and most will never say, uh, you think you might be spending too much here? They will not be saying that. They'll let him spend as much as he wants to spend, to go as deep as he wants to go. And when he gets broke, he gets broke. They're not, but he is. And whatever, whatever money he had, he's just, he's just living off of it. That's all he's doing. And so let's just do a, a, a simple uh, thing with, just use a very simple number, 100. Let's just say that whatever he had equal to 100. We'll, we'll just make it $100. So it, it equaled $100. Okay, so the first dollar he pays out, well, he's only got 99 left. All right, he pays a few more. Well, then it, it, each, each day or each time he's spending something, it's just reducing less and less and less and less and less. And eventually it's going to run out. Depending on how fast he's spending it and how much money he actually had, he's going to run out of that. And he wasted it, wasted those possessions with wasteful living. Verse 14, but when he had spent all, 
there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Now, it is true that if he had been at home and there had been a severe famine in the land, if there had been one there, he would not have been in want there because everything there is stable. Everything there can, uh, is, is uh, done in an orderly way and in the right way to where no one will really go hungry there. No one lacks there in the Father's house. No one has ever lacked there. But he's not at his Father's house anymore. He left that, and he left out of absolute rebellion. Give me, and, and this, is, this is the way certain people can be, of they want God only for what he can give them, only for that, and nothing else. Very much like this, this younger son. Only for what the Father can give him. He has no love for the Father. People, there are certain people that have no love for God, but they, they want him for what he can give them, for what benefits there happens to be with him being God, but obedience to him, no. Staying with him, no. Uh, uh, living right before him, no. Not going to do it. Uh, very much like, like this, as being described here, this prodigal son, of just, I'm going on my way. I'm leaving this house. I'm leaving all of this. I'm going my own way. And so he wastes it all, and then he begins to be in want. It's gone now. He has no safety net. He has nothing. And now he really has no friends. The friends, these friends dry up pretty quick when the money dries up. It's gone. And uh, he doesn't have any sympathetic ear uh, to listen to him at all. Now, verse 15, Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. So this, he's, he's fallen quite a ways. And this is going to be rock bottom for him. He, he's gone from being this son of, of a rather wealthy man to having taken his portion and lived off of it in however he wanted, he's in, in, that's no more. Now he's doing something he never had to do back at home. He's going through these fields feeding swine. And this, you know, when it says the fields, because sometimes we can, we can think of like feeding pigs as being in a pen and you just go and you, you slop whatever is in the trough and then you, you walk away and you go to the next chore. But that's not what's being described here. He's going into the fields that they're not in a nice neat pen at all. Uh, this may be something that takes him all day to do. And this would be very difficult work, especially when you're not eating. This would be very difficult work. In verse 16, he is so hungry, verse 16, and he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. No one gave him anything. You don't get anything until it's payday, whenever that is. You don't get anything until it's, you know, you get paid, and then you can get whatever you need to get. Until then, you work. Until then, you go without. If, if you can't pay for anything, well, no one's going to give you anything because they weren't. And see, here is the thing. As harsh as this is, this was precisely what this younger son needed, what this prodigal son needed to hit rock bottom, to realize, to realize if he would, that he was wrong from the start. That he is where he is because of his own decision. And it can be traced back all the way to what he says in verse 12, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. It traces all the way back to there. And from that point, it's been nothing but bad decisions all the way. 
to where now he's in the fields feeding swine. And what he's feeding them really, I don't think is very edible. These pods, actually they're carob pods. I, I, uh, I don't think that um, uh, one would want to chew on those. Carob is edible, but I think it has to be ground. Anyway, you gladly eat those. But verse 17, but when he came to himself, all right, now here is the turning point for him. And this is what he needed. When he came to himself, what does that mean? That means he's begun to think straight. He's begun to put some things together and actually admit to himself that he's been wrong. Admit to himself that everything was good where he came from. Everything was, was good what he had, and he needs to go back there, which is what, he's, what he says. How many, of my father's hired, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? He remembers how things were, that things were much better back home, where he came from. Now, I want us to look at something for a second. That notice in the parable of the sheep, one sheep goes astray, the shepherd goes to look for the sheep, finds the sheep. In the lost coin, one lost coin, I mean, one, one coin is lost, and you have the woman that sweeps the house to find that coin and finds it. But now in this parable, the father does not go looking across the world trying to find his son. He doesn't go to these diff distant countries. It doesn't even know where his son went. He doesn't go looking for his, his, his son in these distant countries, leaving the one son behind and going and looking to try to bring him back. He doesn't do that. He did. You have the, the shepherd does that. The woman does that. And of course, they all represent God and God's love for just one soul. But why doesn't the father go after the son in this particular parable? Why doesn't he do it? The simple reason is the son was determined to leave. The son despised everything about his home except the money. He despised everything about the father except the father's possessions. He despised everything about that and then just left full speed as quick as he could. He couldn't get out of there fast enough. Not many days after he received those things, he's gone. And his idea is never coming back never coming back. And I have probably told this story before, and I'll tell it again because it is of note. It was uh, years ago in trying out at a congregation, and evidently they had folks that had left the church years earlier. And they asked me, they said, um, what will you do? What is your idea of bringing them back? And I said, well, I guess it's time for a visit. And they said, that's what we do with every preacher we have hired. They are visited. They don't come back. And then the answer to that is, then you leave them alone. You, honestly, you leave them alone. They don't want to come back. Obviously, you don't want them coming back because of the personality of, of some preacher. You, you want them coming back because they see the value in the Word of God and they realize they've done wrong. Okay? So if you have someone who's just a lost sheep that they have, they've just drifted away and uh, that it's not just full bore rebellion, they've just drifted away, visit them and let them return. Yes, and they probably will return. But it, when it's someone who's just out, who hates God, hates Christ, 
hates the church. It doesn't matter who the preacher is. It doesn't matter. It could be someone as Jesus, well, as, as actually Abraham said, it could be someone they know has been dead for years and come back and tell them. And it won't make a bit of difference. It won't make a bit of difference. Abraham said that actually in the next chapter, Luke chapter 16. That though one were to come back from the dead, they won't believe him. Now, we have here in this, this young man who has come now come, coming to his senses. Verse 18, I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, I, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. All right, here is an admission. Full admission. I was wrong. Full admission. Here is someone who hit rock bottom and now admits I was wrong. That's humility, by the way. And that is also an honest heart, by the way. Coming to your senses and then making the right decision of, of yeah, this is all my fault. This has happened because of my massive mistake. It didn't have to be like this. My life could have been so much better, except I've just made one mistake after another, after another, after another, and here I am in this foreign country feeding pigs and starving. Okay. Now here is the example of someone coming back to the senses, but I, can, I know in my own life of seeing others that have just hit rock bottom, but they can't admit, or should say, will not admit it's their own fault, when you know it is. And there's no doubt about it, that it's, it, they cannot, will not admit it's their fault. It was bad luck. It was uh, I, a series of all these misfortunes. Or it is, they, they blame someone else. They don't blame, the, they may even blame God. They blame someone else, but will not turn it to where the blame lies. And it's with them and their decisions. Bad, very bad decisions. And therefore, they don't come to their senses. They don't, because they cannot will not, I keep saying that, they will not look to see and with an honest heart and with an humble heart understand this is my doing, yes. I did this. And there are consequences to it. And you know, the world, actually, Satan doesn't want you to even think on consequences. Doesn't even want you to think about that. Just think on the, the pleasure, and of course, it's just all empty, empty lies, empty promises. That's, that's all it is. Just thinking on the pleasures that, that uh, you, may, you will obtain by this. It's like with uh, you know, beer commercials or, or commercials concerning alcohol, of where, what do you see? You see beautiful young people having fun. That's what you see. You don't see anything else. You don't see the, uh, the abuse. You don't see the divorce. You don't see uh, the guy who's now in the emergency room because of something that occurred. You don't see uh, the one who now wants to, to kill his friend. You don't see that. You don't see the, the everyone becoming utterly unhinged and where it's not such a pleasure house anymore it's become a bloodbath, or it's become just a, a place that's horrid. Satan doesn't want you to see that. He doesn't want you to see that at all. But with sin, there are consequences, yes, here, as well as in eternity. There's not, it, it, it gives nothing. It gives nothing worthwhile. Now, can someone reach rock bottom, and then return? Well, according to this parable, yes. Sure can. 
Will the Father accept this lost son? Accept this? Will God accept the sinner who left him and is returning? And the answer is yes. So we see where he, all he wants is just to be a hired servant. That's all. Verse 20, And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran, ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. He knew why he was coming back home. He knew who it was. He hadn't gone off looking for him because there's no point in it. He won't come back. You're just going to disappoint yourself. You're just going to waste your time. He won't come back until he's ready to come back. And hopefully, prayerfully, that will occur. But he's not coming back until he does. And when the father sees him, he recognizes him. No telling, you know, in the, the parable doesn't say this, but he's been starving. No doubt he's, he's lost some weight. No doubt he's, he's aged a bit. Don't know how long he's been away. But the father sees him at a great distance, knows exactly who that is, and goes running. He doesn't even let the, the son guess what the reception will be. The reception is full. The reception is in love. The reception is generous. And he accepts him back as a son. And we see this, verse 21, And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. He does exactly what he said he was going to do. And am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf here and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. Here is this celebration that this son has returned. And, of course, the father in, in this parable would not have known the, the condition of the son, of what he had gone through, anything like that. He would not have known. He's just, just waiting on him. Now, concerning God the Father, yeah, he knows everything we go through. He knows every thought. He knows every swine we've had to feed. He knows every, every hardship, every uh, rocky ground we've, we've been on. He knows all of that. And at our return, here is the beauty of it. At our return, He welcomes us. Well, who were those tax collectors and those sinners being discussed at the beginning of this chapter? But that of that younger son. But now, this parable changes and shifts over to talk about the older son. And this one describes those Pharisees and scribes who they consider themselves better than those sinners, considerably better than even your common person that they would not necessarily call a sinner, just kind of common, okay? Lackluster and, okay, yeah, whatever, uh, you're, you're not as bad as a tax collector, obviously. You're not, you're not a prostitute, obviously. You're not an extortioner, obviously. You're not an idolater, obviously. But still better than you. Okay, Here's, here now we're switching to this. Verse 25, Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. Okay, something is happening. He's been away working all day. He knows nothing about what has occurred. He, and one can rightfully say, as the father will say, you, you've been faithful in these things. You've been faithful. He's been out all day doing whatever he's supposed to be doing. He's been doing the work. And now he's coming back. And he's coming back with an attitude. An attitude that no doubt has been boiling over for a while. So we called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. What's going on over there? And he said to him, Your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. 
But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore, the father came out and pleaded with him. He would not accept the brother's return. He would rather the brother die somewhere else than to return and to be accepted by the father. He would rather, yeah, the the younger brother return back and be tossed away by the father. There's no way you are welcome here ever again. No way will we accept you. No way what you did was reprehensible, and there's nothing you can do to redeem that. There's nothing you can do to, to, to change that. Go away. Now, two things just happened that the older brother didn't want. The younger brother returns and the father accepts him. Two things that he didn't want. Two things that the Pharisees and the, and the scribes did not want. They did not want the people searching for and listening to the Christ, and they did not want the Christ accepting them. It's two things that they did not want. And yeah, they were seeing that through Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ, that he was speaking to these people, some of whom were sinners, that Jesus is teaching these people, and he's teaching, some of his teaching actually is the complete opposite of what the Pharisees and the scribes have been teaching. Some of the teaching is opposite of what the Sadducees have been teaching. Some of it is actually condemning them for the things that they have done. You've got the, uh, in the, the, uh, the temple, you have the money changers, and you have all these businesses that make a tremendous living because the temple and because people have to come to the temple to worship. They make a tremendous living off of that. And that was never to be the case. That's not what the temple was to have been or the tabernacle before it. And it was dishonest is what was going on. It was highly dishonest, but also highly profitable for them. There was also the fact of that you have the, the people like the Pharisees. They would tell others to do certain things, but they themselves wouldn't touch it with their finger. They wouldn't lift it with a finger. They wouldn't do anything about that. Others, yes, themselves, no. And so they began to despise Jesus and they wanted to destroy him and also keep everyone in their place. That a sinner is a sinner is a sinner. A tax collector is a tax collector and cannot get out from underneath being a tax collector. That they are just, because they've they've done this, they can never return back to God. Never. And they wouldn't be accepted by, this, by the scribes and the Pharisees. And this older brother, he becomes angry at all this. And we see the father comes out to speak with him. So in verse 28, again, but he was angry and would not go in. Therefore, his father came out, came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. All right. There, all, all that's happened here is I've been, I've been doing the things that the younger brother didn't do. My, my brother didn't do these things. I did all these things. I was here day in, day out, good weather, bad weather. I was here all year round, every year. And what can I say about it? You never so much as killed a goat that I may make merry with my friends. And here is, and that's, that's a very rotten attitude. It's a very rotten attitude because someone who remains faithful, you know, we just go back to verse 7. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents 
than over the 99 just persons who need no repentance. There's no need to, to uh, celebrate because of the 99. The 99 were safe and in place. They weren't gone and have returned. They're good, but there is joy over that one that does return. There's joy in heaven over that over that one. There's now joy at this at the house of the Father because of the Son that went away and now has returned. But notice what the Father says to him. It's, it's not as though you're nothing. It's no, you can't, don't be resentful about all of this. It's not as though you haven't been loved, as though you, you, have, you have nothing at all. And now in verse 30, continuing with what the older brother says, but as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. It's just resentment. Now the father answers, and he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. And that's true. That's true. Because... It's not going to be divided up between older and younger now. The younger has already taken his. That's done. Now he's returned. He's accepted back. But understand, yeah, that everything, everything that's here that remains is yours. It's yours. And also we come to this point of, you know, you haven't been away in sin and returned which is good. But why shouldn't we celebrate when someone returns back home? Why shouldn't we celebrate? It was with resentment. It was with hatred. It was because, because of these sins, because he's taken your livelihood and he's spinning on harlots of which he knew nothing about. He could not have known anything about that. He's, now, whether it's true or not, I don't know. But the older brother couldn't have known that anyway. But he says, he's, he spent all this on harlots, and you've accepted him back, and you've killed the fatted calf for him. That here is just this resentment, and it shouldn't be. So, verse 32 it was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. It was right. This is what should have been done. We should rejoice that he's back. And that also includes the older brother, that older son. He should be rejoicing that he's back, but he's not. And like I said, he would prefer... The, the, that younger son to just disappear and never return, or if he did return, that the father never accepts him, just sends him packing, go away. But what kind of God is that? That is a God that is truly unloving. That is a God that truly does not have mercy, nor could supply any grace at all. Because if he's willing to do that, then anything that the older son might have done in breaking any kind of law, any kind of will of the father, then he'd be sent packing too. But the father has mercy. And here is the good news for all of us. The good news. God accepts us all. We have to obey Him. We have to return to Him. Now, don't think that, that just, just going off in rebellion, that God just will be pleased with you no matter what. That's not true. But returning back to Him, that is the returning back in repentance, returning back in obedience, returning back from, from a heart now wanting God, a heart now wanting to return back to Him, and He will accept all. When Jesus gives the words in Matthew chapter 5, or no, sorry, not chapter 5, Matthew chapter 7, He says this, Ask, beginning of verse 7, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. That's given to everybody, you realize. 
That's given to everybody. That's not given to, to just the, the righteous people that happen to be in, 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 the, in, the, in the audience. He's not saying that just to those who are good-natured folks and easy to love and, and all of that and will willingly follow Him. This is given, this is a promise given to everybody, everybody. That would be Pharisees. How many did it? We know Paul. We know for certain Paul did. That's given to the scribes. How many did it? Well, we don't know. Was that given, that was given to the, the Sadducees, that was given to the Herodians, that was given to the most worldly, that was given to, to those, to the Romans. It's given to everybody. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. The Father will do it. And He's doing it through Christ. The Father will do it. And it is mercy that is given to all. But it requires something out of us. And that is returning back to Him. Returning to Him and actually admitting that we've made a massive mistake. And it's time to turn things around. The words here are for us to understand. When Jesus gives that, that parable, it's, for, it's really good news for everybody. Now, those that won't, don't want to make it good news, then okay, you're just disturbed by good news. But with, with this, it is good news for us all because God accepts all back. And if He doesn't accept all back, then guess what? He doesn't accept anybody back. It's all or nothing. He accepts all. He's not a respecter of persons. It's all can return back to Him. And it is with joy in heaven that the return, that the, the celebration over that one, that one returning is made. It's made of thinking of joy in heaven because of someone in our eyes, kind of rough, someone in our eyes, they, they've been living, who knows, past 5, 10, 30 years in sin and returning back how are we supposed to receive them? We receive them with joy, exactly as the Father, Christ, the Holy Spirit, all of heaven rejoices over that one person, that one soul coming back to Him. The words are for our learning. The words are for us so that we can understand what God wants for us. We can understand how we're going to be judged. By what standard we're going to be judged? You ignore this, you're ignoring everything that's important. We're all going to be judged according to the New Testament. And we're going to be judged as to whether we obeyed that or not. And we need to, you know, the plea here is to get back to the Bible. The plea is not, not to, to go after traditions. The plea isn't to go after just uh, the, the fanciful things. It's to go after the simple Word of God. That's it. Just after that. That's what we believe. That's what we are to do. And it's simplicity itself. Returning back to Him. These words for our believing and in believing. We have faith, obviously, in Him. Faith also in His words to guide us that we are to repent of our sins. Turning away from them. Confessing of faith. That Jesus is the Christ. That truly is to have that faith. Jesus is the Christ and be baptized and our sins are forgiven there. We are raised in a newness of life. We put on Christ through baptism. There we are a new creature in His kingdom. Saved. Now to live as we should. Live as one who truly is repentant. We ask this morning, if you need to respond to the invitation, that you come as we stand and sing.